show from Manfred with Joe Peters. Welcome to the Spanglish Network and the Hair Network on the Single TV channels 250 and 251. Please remember to download the Single TV app in their respective iOS and Android devices. While you are downloading, make sure that you rate the app and leave us a comment. The app is free. And the app can also be watch in Google Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Fire TV, Roku, and Roku Stick in all the smart TVs since 2016. Now, if you are doing that and you're watching in your tablet or your phone, make sure that you are also following me in my social media, Joe Unicorn Coach. I handle my own social media. So if you are having a question, an issue, a challenge, or you just need support from a community of amazing moms, send me a message. And then if I cannot help you and support you or guide you, I will find an expert like Jill to come to the show and we will do it together. Because the mission of MomFed is helping you to win the marathon of motherhood without burnout. Now, I am super excited about talking with Jill because Jill is going to talk with us and share with us about what we need to do in order to understand the challenging behaviors in our young children. And then this is an amazing topic because it doesn't matter if you are pregnant, it's going to help you a lot more to start thinking about these and take notes, even if after two years you need to go and review the notes that G is going to share. If you are leaving it right now, or even if you are uh, after the critical age, because... I believe that these challenging uh, behaviors keep happening. It's just that they keep happening less frequent. So Jill is a ocean of wisdom and knowledge. She's an early childhood interventionist and had a master's in level social worker. Who ha- And she's been working with parents of young children in their homes for nearly 30 years. In that time, she had supported thousands of families by providing them with the foundational knowledge and skills need to help them to support the child's learning, grow, and development. She is a specialist in toddler speech. We are going to have another uh, episode for that specifically. Social emotional development, positive discipline, and behavior. Jill, thank you so, so much for being here. I would love to start the show asking you about your phrase. And that is, I asked all our guests to give us a phrase. And your phrase was, be the change that you want to see. Welcome to the show, Jill. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and support parents. Yeah. Why you don't just tell me a little bit about that phrase? Like, what is that is your favorite phrase about be the change you want to see? I think it's really important for us to always be on a pathway of growth and to, you know, we see a lot of things in the world. We see a lot of things that we want to be, see, diff, you know, be different, but we have to do something to facilitate change, you know? So I really believe that we should always be trying to look at how can we help and support others. If we work together, and support each other, support our kids, support our extended family, support our friends and our community, we're going to leave the world a better place for our kids. And that's always my goal is what can we do to make things better for our kids and our grandkids and future generations? I love that. Love that. Jill, let's go talk a little bit about who Jill is. What is your story, your 30 years, where and how do you fall in love with this topic and with working with parents, because this is a topic that everybody wants to run away from and <laughs> get away from as soon as possible, but you actually are dive in there. So let's gonna talk a little bit about your story and, and where and how you get to work on this beautiful part of a family history. Well, you know, it's really interesting because uh, when I went to college, I didn't have this on my radar anywhere. I never wanted to work with families or kids ever. I went and got my master's degree and I ended up working for the Department of Corrections, working with adult serious offenders. So people that were in for life for murder and started doing um, like cognitive behavioral kind of work with them. And the 
the, the prison that I was located was kind of like a younger kid prison. So most of the people that were in there, there were some as young as 13 serving life sentences. So they were typically between the ages of 16 and 24. And as I started to work with these young men, I was just really struck by how brilliant so many of them were. I mean, they were so smart and how um, they all had a similar history, right, of not having parents that were present, um, abuse or neglect. And, you know, I really enjoyed working with them a lot, but I just sat there and I thought to myself, if what if I could do something to help support other kids from ending up here? You know, because I mean, I, I remember one guy I was working with, just listening to him talk, I'm like, you know, if you had put one tenth of your energy into pro-social behaviors as a voice as, instead of the anti-social behaviors, I'm like, man, you could have been the president. He was just brilliant. But he came from a home where his mom had to work two jobs. So he was left alone a lot. Him and his siblings, he got involved with gangs because that became his connection where he got his connection because he couldn't get it from his mom. But she was doing her best to provide for the family. And I just thought, gosh, if I could do something to help kids stop ending up here. So from there, I ended up working as a protective services worker here in the county that I work in. So I did that for about five years. And um, I don't want to say I loved that job because it was really, really stressful lying in bed, wondering if, you know, worrying about everybody else's kids. And I was just starting my own family. But I did definitely fall in love with working with families and being in people's houses because it's real. <laughs> what you see in a home is real, so different than like an office setting. You know, you get to see it all. And it was really awesome to be able to build connections with families and to try to figure out how can we support a family so that they can, you know, do the things that they need to do with their kids. Because I, I with the exception of one woman who was an adoptive mom, I never met a parent that even as a CPS worker, no matter what happened with their kids, that didn't love their child with every fiber of their body. But these parents came from a history of abuse and neglect as well. So it's that whole generational thing. So I did that for about five years. And then uh, my kids were really little. I had my, my son, he was probably about two or three. My daughter was just a baby. And it was just taking a toll on me emotionally. You know, like I didn't know when I'd be able to get home because if you get an emergency, you don't know. And I, like I said, tossing and turning about other people's kids thinking, is this little one going to be okay tomorrow? And I just thought, I can't keep doing this forever and be able to be the mom that I want to be with my kids. And an opportunity came up with a local school district to um, be an early childhood interventionist. Never done it before. Had never worked with babies with delays and toddlers with delays. Didn't know anything about it. But I was like, I need this job. I got to get out. <laughs> and so I bugged the special ed dir director, director for about three months every week. Did you hire anybody? Did you hire anybody? And she finally just gave me the job. And I have been in love with it ever since. I love working with families. And I think a piece of it is because at this time that I started, I was in a really rough stage. My son was three. My daughter was about one. And I was really struggling as a mom with my son. He was a challenge, smart, sassy. I mean, I remember one time he was just being really sassy. And he, uh, I, I took everything out of his room everything out of his room, except the sheets and bedding and his clothes. And I came in, I brought him in. I said, see what happens here? I said, this is, this is what happens when you get sassy with your mom. And he said, that's okay. I don't need any of that stuff. And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? <laughs> so I really dove into, you know, how can I be a better parent to him? What I'm doing isn't working. I have to change who I am as far as my interactions with him. And then I was able to apply what I was learning to the families who were going through the exact same thing. And then my daughter came along and she had a speech delay. So I worked with kids with speech delays. So I knew exactly what the parents were feeling and the frustration. So then I started learning about that. And so I think it, it comes down to make your mess your message. So I had a mess. I learned how to overcome that mess. And now I'm making it my message. And every parent that I see that's struggling with language or behavior, I just see myself in them. I love that. Make your mess your message. I'm going to uh, quote that um, later on, on on my groups. But I love the transition and the, the journey that you went through. And 
I love how you take the time to explain us that because that's right. Like it's very easy for us when the kids are 16 or 18 or 20 or 22 judge and, and regret and do things there. But then we don't look into the teens and the 12 and the 10 years old. And then we don't go into actually the first couple of years. And one of the things that I do with my mom's too is understanding that over 90% of your child perception of the world and how they react is built between the second trimester of being pregnant to seven years old. So yeah, we always can do something after. Yes. But the work that we do in those first seven years and a half is crucial. Um, and that is where sometimes we are more lost into all of these. So let's go talk a little bit about that. Let's go and understand a little bit more about those key development milestones in young children and what is actually normal and expected versus what is just my kid just want to make me miserable with all these tantrums. So I was going to go a little bit into that part. Well, let me start with something that a very wise therapist said to a dad that I was working in. It, it was a CPS case, and the dad had two sons that were teenagers, and he was a single dad doing the best he could. And he was trying to pin those kids down with his thumb, and they were like pushing away and running off and doing stuff. And and we were having a conversation with the therapist who was working with the family, and the dad was just like, why do they do this to me? And la, 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 I'm trying so hard. Don't they know how hard this is? And he said, hey, the number one rule of parenting is you can't take anything your kids say or do personally. Number one rule of parenting. And I was like, wisdom wrote that down because I was like, oh, my gosh, I take everything my son was doing personally. Like, why is he doing this to me? Why does he challenge me? So I think that that's the starting point, right? Is to keep in mind when our kids are acting out, when they're doing those difficult behaviors, to remember that they're not doing it to us. They're not trying to make us mad. They're not trying to uh, be difficult. They're, they're learning. So when those difficult things come up, instead of taking it personally, what I encourage parents to do is when a a behavior is coming up to look at it through a different lens. They're struggling right now. What can I do to support them? What tools do I need? I think when we change our mindset, and I, I always tell parents, 80% of parenting is our mindset. Only 20% is what we're actually doing. 80% is how we're looking at things. Like I have a, a, a group that I'm working with and the mom was like, oh, you know, we're going to the park. It's going to be awful. They run away. They do this, da, da, da. And I said, but what if when you got up that morning, before you take them to the park, you, you said to yourself, this is going to be amazing. Everything is going to go smoothly. The kids are going to be great. Everything's going to be fine and I can handle it all. And she's like, well, I guess I could try that. Guess what? She reported the next day. <laughs> it went great. And it's like our, our mind determines our actions. And it determines our energy. And if you're going into an energy into a situation with an energy that you're expecting things to go wrong, guess what? It's going to go wrong because your kids pick up on your energy. They've actually done research that infants as young as six months old can pick up on marital discord in a home. This is mind blowing. And I love what you say. Never take it personal. Moms, write this down. Yeah. Never take it personal. And one of the things that I love about that is I was smiling because two things that I learned early on that I really have as mantra is never take it personal. They are not giving you a hard time. They are having never. a hard time. They yeah. are actually struggling with something that they cannot manage. And then the other one that is being mind blowing for me is Sometimes we are like, but they are good with everybody else. And with me, it's a disaster. And that actually, and I want to hear your opinion, it's a sign of emotional attachments. They actually express all the things that they don't know how to handle with the person that they feel the safest. So actually, I was telling one of the moms that she was telling me this. She was like, I cannot believe that she behaved like this. And I was like, she was an entire week with her narcissist father and a horrible thing. She is just feeling safe to get all of this out. And that is why she's acting out. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about that and how those behaviors are. And I will put you in full screen. I need to get something in my, in my house and I will be right back. Sure. Absolutely. So when I 
when when parents are telling me about their little ones really struggling with them at home or acting out with them at home, one thing that I always tell them is it's actually a really good thing because it is a testament to the bond that your child has with you. So our kids in our home are always going to be testing the boundaries and pushing things and giving us, you know, more of those big emotions because we're the safest person for them to do that with. Because even though we may not like how they're acting in those moments, we're never going to not love them in those moments. And so it's really important for us to remember that, that, yeah, they, they are going to be great for the daycare and the teacher and all of that. And they are going to give us a run for the money because they're just trying to figure out how their world how their world is, you know, and what works at home. This is one thing I always talk to parents about is that you are establishing, especially in those first five years, you are creating your child's worldview. And that's why I'm always a big fan and always talk about big picture. We always should be looking at what we're doing as parents through the lens of big picture. So an example of that would be if, you know, I'll go on a home and there's a two-year-old standing on the top of a table eating. And, you know, I, no judgment, no judgment, right? Because that, that's a parent's choice. But I'll ask the parent, you know, um, are you okay with them eating on the table? You know, because they're going to go to preschool in, you know, just a couple of months. And they're not going to be able to do that at preschool. And they're like, well, I, I guess they, you know, I, I don't mind them doing it at home. And I'm like, but this is what I'm saying is that our worldview, if we allow it at home at two, two and a half, then when they get to school at three, the expectation is for them that I should be able to do this anywhere. I should be able to do it at grandma's house. I should be able to do it because if it's allowed in my home, then it must be okay everywhere. Kids don't have the ability cognitively to know that, oh, I, you know, mom says you can only do that at home. They don't have the ability to have that kind of restraint, right? Their, their, their worldview is whatever you allow in the home. So we always have to be thinking down the road, you know, is what I'm doing now going to help my child in the next scenario? right? Is this the skill that they're going to need six months from now, a year from now? And when we think big picture, we end up giving our kids lots more tools. So that can be frustrating for them. And that's why they do do a lot of that acting out. But just know that that is a testament to your bond to them. And it is them just trying to figure out where the limits are in the world, because they'll take that. And then they'll go out into the world and know that like, if I hit my mom, that doesn't work out for me. So I'm not going to try it with somebody that I don't have a relationship with. You know, if I throw things at home, they get taken away or put up for the rest of the day. So I'm not going to try that in a situation with people that I don't have that kind of bond with. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So with that being said, um, because then the, I think that the challenge, for example, with example on the table is how we can hold a good, healthy boundary without going into our childhood trauma, that was probably how our parents and grandparents did it, more into like uh, punishment or manipulation or even sometimes even physical uh, mm -hmm. repercussions, but it's still doing it. And then understanding that it's exhausting, like because I wasn't smiling because I was saying like, sometimes it's just like, I am so tired that whatever. <laughs> If you're going to eat, just eat. So um, what are some of the tips that the parents can do to not get to that point and then start holding those boundaries in a way that I, I actually, th I'm trying to read this book. It's not in the library, but in a way that children listen because they are always listening, but what they are doing with that, that they are listening in your experience. Well, and I would actually say that they're watching more than they're listening. 93% of communication is our body language and our tone of voice. Only 7% is actually the words that we use. And in my many years of working in homes with parents of young children, I would say the biggest mistake that parents make is too much talking and not enough action. And when we do too much talking, we're actually teaching our kids not to listen to us. So an example would be, let's use the example of the little one on the table. And this is actually from a home visit that I did many years ago, a little girl jumping on a glass table, up and down on this glass table. And I was like, oh, that makes me kind of nervous. So when I asked the mom about it, I said, do you want her to do it? And she said, no. 
And she said, but she doesn't listen to me. And I said, well, show me what you normally do. And I, I can't remember the little girl's name. We'll just say it was Josie. And she's like, Josie, get down. Josie, stop. Josie, 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 stop. And Josie's just a bouncing, looking at her mom, having a great time, <laughs> jumping on the table. And the mom said, after like 20 times, she's like, see, she doesn't listen to me. She doesn't listen to me. And I said, well, I have to ask you which one of those you actually meant. And she just kind of looked at me and she's like, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, I said, let's use the example of a dog chewing a shoe. If you're, if you had a dog and it was chewing your shoe, would you say, cut it out, stop it, stop it? I said, what would you do? And she's like, well, I get up and I take the shoe away. And I'm like, yeah, it's the same for our kids. And so I said, do you want me to demonstrate? And she was like, okay. And I said, oh, we are all, and as soon as I started getting up, I said, we are all done. She got down from the table and she's like, oh, and I said, they're looking for our action. All they're hearing is this, what, 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 what. Nothing means anything until you're moving towards me. So as exhausting as this is, because that's the hard part, I think, about toddlers in particular, is we're having to do a lot of physical prompting and moving, and we have to get up and we're tired. But I always tell parents, if you do the hard work now to follow through when you're giving those limits or those redirections, it's going to pay off down the road because you're teaching your child that my, my mom says what she means, means what she says and does what she says she's going to do. If you can get your kids to learn that at a young age, when they're six and you tell them, oh, you're no fun to be around right now. Why don't you go on up to your room and come on down when you can talk to me in a nice voice or when you're in a better mood, they're just going to go up the steps without any, <laughs> without any arguing because they already know they're going to end up someplace anyhow. <laughs> so I might as well do it. So it's really about taking action and using fewer words. Keep it really simple with young kids, like get down instead of, you know, if you jump on the table, it's going to break and you can hurt your arm. And then I don't want to go to the emergency room. We talk too much, especially us moms. That's uh, why a I lot mean, of times, that's why they, they listen to dads a lot of times more than they listen to us because dads keep it simple. And us moms, we tend to, <laughs> we tend to go on and the kids are like, I, I don't know what any of that means. Just what do we, what do you need me to do? I love it. And actually what you were saying about um, that only 7% is our voice. Uh, are, are what we are saying and the other part is the voice and, and the physical body body. language. Mm -hmm. I had a fantastic story. My husband was traveling two weeks ago or three weeks ago and every night my toddler and I went downstairs to feed the kitties. He helped me to feed the kid. Sometimes was a little more playful, but he went all week um, effortlessly. And then my husband came and normally my husband does that with my kids. And then the first night that my, my toddler started moving, then my vo my husband's tone voice changed. And you can feel his, his stress and his anxiety, like, like, no, Elliot, this, that. And then and then I came down and I was like, what's going on? And then I told him, so like, you know what is the funny thing? He never pulled the cat's tail when he's feeding the cats with me. Mm -hmm. He's doing it because he's hearing a reaction in your tone, a reaction in your body language that he doesn't have with me. So he knows that he's not going to have that reaction with me, so he doesn't do it with me. But with you, he's doing it to get that reaction. So I love what you are saying, and I love, especially for all the moms, because this is something that requires training, right? That we mm -hmm. do it over and over. I love what you are saying. Instead of saying it 20 times and then get the natural consequence, say it once and then immediately follow through. Well, body action, body action to show them that there is the natural consequence is going to happen. And I would even say you should be giving the instruction as you're moving towards them. Right. So like uh, I was on a home visit last week and the little guy was getting into something and the mom started to do uh, like one, two, which I'm not against one, two, three and counting. Um, but I always, if a parent is going to use that strategy, suggest go backwards, three, two, one, because kids know usually around three that there's more numbers. So I don't know. Is she going to go to three? Is she going to go to five? Maybe she'll give me some slack and go to 10. So it just prolongs everything. And the other thing I told her is you should be up and moving when you're saying three and you should count fast. Three, two, one, as you're moving over towards them. Because then when you stand up on three, they're going to be like, oh, okay, she means it. And off they're going to go. And one of it is that I remember when you are saying that was, um, I think I was another guest here that was talking about a little boy that 
similar. Oh, he doesn't understand. He doesn't listen to me. I have to yell. And then in the interaction, they were talking and the therapist was talking with the child and child was like, well, I like watching the cartoon. Why am I going to stop it in the first one if I know that she's going to keep saying it until she scream? When she scream, then I know that I need to turn off the TV. So they are also very smart into knowing what is your boundary and what is your yes. limit. So mm-hmm. they will push until they know that they the they reach the limit. And then when they reach the limit, they usually back off. Yeah. The problem is that what you're saying is, is our responsibility to make sure that that limit is not super big, but it's very short. So it's like, I'm telling you this, and then that's it. And now, when that happened, especially around young children, uh, challenging behaviors, and we hold the boundary, we take them out of the table, we turn off the TV, we Mm -hmm. do the natural consequence, Mm -hmm. and then there is a meltdown. How we can stay there and support them and make them understand that it is okay to feel frustrated and Mm -hmm. that that is a consequence for the other thing, like how we can finalize the circle. Because I think that a lot of parents don't hold that boundary because they are afraid of that meltdown. And I don't know how long the meltdown is going to be, or I don't know how bad it's going to be. So what happened after? So I always um, use with the families that I'm working with uh, a strategy that I call the three C's, calm, connect, incorrect. Sometimes it's a redirect. So when kids go into tantrums and meltdowns, they have tumbled down the stairs into the primitive brain. So they're all about feeling at that moment. And this is a really important part during the first step, which is we have to calm their brain. We shouldn't be talking to them during the process of them calming their brain. Nothing is getting through. I always tell parents, think about being that enraged that you're in tears and throwing yourself on the ground. Are you really going to be listening to somebody talking to you in that moment? You're going to be like, get the heck away from me. I need some space or I just need quiet. Let me just pull myself together. If we put ourselves in our kids' shoes, (laughs) it really helps us to have a different perspective of how we're handling things sometimes too. So the first step is to calm. And what I suggest for parents to do is to identify a calm down zone in their home. Now, if you have a multi-level home, I think you should have one on each floor. It can be the child's room. And I'll talk more about that in a minute because I know sometimes parents are like, I don't know about that. If you're upstairs, it could be the bedroom in the living room, finding some area. If you have a playroom in the basement, because you don't want to be chucking your kid up and down steps to take them to a calm down zone. So the idea with the calm down zone is you find a quiet area. I like to find corner areas. And I should be clear in the beginning, a calming calm down zone is not a timeout. It is not a punishment. It is a safe zone to have big emotions that is set up in a way to try to facilitate that happening more quickly by making sure that it's got a soft, squishy place for them to land. Because then they're getting the extra sensory input. And that's a whole different, that's a whole different show, Joe, talking about what's going on with our young kids under the age of five and their sensory systems. But having a soft, squishy place for them to land, like I like getting the big, supersized bean bags that the adult can sit in with the child and weighted blankets or weighted toys or big squishy pillows or a comforter. The idea is, is that when I'm in this place with these big emotions and I'm getting all of that extra sensory input, it's going to make it easier for my brain to calm faster. Or I should say my body, because really with the calming, we're calming their body, right? So when they're in the calm down, we should not be talking to them and we can be there with them if they want us there. Some kids want us to be next to them. Some kids are going to do the push away. And if they don't want us to be touching them, then we're just going to be close by. But we need to stay close. We can't just put them in the calm down and then go in another room. They need us to regulate, right? So we start with the calming. Once they they calm, and we're talking young kids here, they're not going to be like, okay, I'm good. You know, they're still going to be like, (laughs) but if they're not screaming at the top of their lungs and they're not kicking and thrashing at you, right? It's that kind of resignation that they get as they're kind of like, okay, I'm still upset. Then we move into connection. And that's where we can stay in the calm down zone. You know, hey, sweetie, do you need some snuggles with mom? Do you want to stay here and do that? And if they're like, "Mm -hmm, yeah, okay, then we're just going to sit and we're just going to connect and just snuggle. We're not talking about what they did wrong. We're not talking about any of that. 
The connection phase is where we're now calming the brain, right? So calm is the body, calming the body. Connection is calming the brain. So however long that takes your child, it could be, you know, do you want to read some books? Should we look at some books or do you just want to, you know, just want to snuggle? I just want to snuggle. It can be on the couch, wherever the child wants to do it, wherever you want to do it. Once they've gotten calm, right, more calm, then we're going to just kind of, hey, what do you want to do? Let's let's go play some Play-Doh or do you want to go play outside? We're going to go outside. We want to get them to 100%, them happy selves again, because there's still a lot of shame for kids because kids do feel shame. An embarrassment. They feel all of those things. We want to get them back to being in a happy place. That's when we can do either the do the the correction. So if they haven't done something where like they've hurt somebody or made a really bad choice, we're just going to redirect. We can go outside and play, and we really don't need to talk about it. We don't need to talk about what happened. They just had a a big a big emotions, and that's okay. We don't need to talk about it anymore. But if they've done something that hurt somebody or that was dangerous or that you want them to learn from, then when they're back in 100%, that's when we have the conversation. So, for example, oh, hey, you know, remember when you hit your sister that really hurt her? Do you think maybe you should maybe go give her a hug? Let her know how you feel about what you did? And then almost every time they're like, yes, they go over and it's more heartfelt right? Like it's sincere. When we try to make that process come right after, it's just, a, oh, I'm sorry. And they just want to get it done and get it over with. So calm, connect, redirect if it wasn't something serious that hurt anybody that they you need to talk to them about, or then correct, but when they're in a good mood. And that is true of every age. We should always have hard, hard conversations with our kids when they're in a good mood because they're going to be far more receptive to listening. I love that. Come, connect, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I love that because now let's gonna go into the other side is how we as parents can, what are the tips for us to cultivate the patient to go through that? Because I'll tell you like it takes a lot of effort sometimes. Like I'll tell you Wednesday, we were in a Sumbini class. And at the end of the Zumbini class, my baby, my toddler, run across the gym and push another girl. And then there was a lot of my own insecurities because a lot of the moms were like, whoa. So it was like me, like, oh, my God, the judgment of other moms. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, like on those cases and because it's like that, like how we can. What are the strategies for us to keep our cup full enough that we can be present and don't let our own emotions running so we can do that process because the issue is when their big emotions trigger our big emotions and then we are also in fire or fight response, then we are not going to have the the clarity of remember Jill calm mm. correct. We are going to just explode and then yeah. we will need to repair. So exactly. what, what are some of those things that the parents can start working on to be present in that moment and hold what their children need instead of getting triggered and going in and fight or fight. Well, I'm going to tell you the number one thing that's going to impact that is to do daily self care. And I'm not talking about taking a bubble bath or going and getting a pedicure. I am talking about finding some time every single day that you have to yourself. It could be 10 minutes it could be 20 minutes, it could be an hour. But when we as parents, particularly us moms, because we give, 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 and then we got nothing left in our well, and that's when we really get dysregulated like our kids, just like they do. So self-care is not a luxury. It's a requirement for you as a parent to show up the way that you want to show up. The, the parents that I work with, when they tell me about the rough week that they had, I, the first thing I ask him is, what have you been doing um, with your self-care plan? Well, I haven't really had time to do it. And how is that working out for you and your child? Well, you know what? It's not. The parents who are doing the self-care, they're like, I had a great week. So many wins. I handled this really difficult situation. And this really." And I'm like, well, let me ask you this. How are you doing with your self-care? And they're like, I have made sure that every day I listen to my podcast or I do my meditation or I work out. I'm making sure. Yeah, I did it every day, Jill. That is the difference. And I think 
moms in particular have to get over this mindset that taking care of themselves should be on the back burner. It should absolutely 100% be on the front burner. It should be your priority every day to take care of you because when you take care of you, you can take care of kids. And even more important than that is you are modeling for your kids. If you're putting everybody else's needs in front of your own, guess what? What is your kid going to do when they grow up? Yeah, same thing. So if you want them to have a healthy sense of self and that they're important and taking care of themselves is important, then you need to model that right from the get-go. So don't feel guilty about it. It is a must. I Can you tell I'm passionate about that one? I oh. love it. And we are completely aligned with that. I, I was actually loving I finished um, a book from Rachel Cargill. And she, I love one of her phrases was, your better self is your self-rest. Is mm -hmm. your rest self. And, and, and it's true. And, and I love how, because sometimes we talk about self-care and, and our time, but I love how you are connecting it to the literally the point where you need it the most. It's almost like when you are investing in your self-care, in addition to you, you are also investing because that is going to give you the bandwidth to handle the challenging behaviors, to handle the to to handle the meltdowns, to handle the tantrums, to handle the the big screens. Now, let's gonna talk a little bit on that one into that comparison and uh, communication styles of different children and how different they can be because we also have that like, oh. But your child is so calm, or or I my first child was not like this, and then we are almost trying to put them all within the same box. And how much of that is reality, and how much of that is us being aware of their own universe and understand that instead of us trying to make them change and behave different, is us trying to understand how they communicate, how they express emotions. I will tell you, like, with simple things like a kid that is an empath versus a kid that is not an empath, a kid that is an empath will have, in my opinion, as an empath, a lot more bigger emotions and a lot more tantrums because they are feeling everything a lot more. So I was going to talk about that into the challenging behaviors. Do all children have challenging behaviors and do all children have them in the same way or the challenging behaviors can be show up in different parts depending on the of the child? Well, I love that you brought this up because whenever whenever I'm working with families, like the first thing, the first tool in your toolbox is to understand development, right? Just knowing developmental norms, what's going on with their brains, what's social emotionally they should be able to do, what they're not able to understand because a lot of times we overestimate what kids' skills are and we're expecting them to understand things or to control their emotions in ways that they're just not, from a brain development standpoint, even close to being ready to do. The second piece is when we understand the development, the next piece should be to look at our child's individual wiring. So this has a big impact on what we see, but then understanding their unique wiring has a big impact because like you said, every child is different. So temperament is huge in how our kids receive and understand the world and navigate it. And I think that was the thing going back to like when my son was driving me crazy is I was working on my agenda and what would work for me and what I wanted, but I wasn't recognizing and looking at his unique wiring and adapting to that. And that was my, that's my job as a parent is to figure out his wiring and then figure out how I can help support him. So temperament is really big and there are actually 12 different temperament traits, but when they break them down, they fall into three categories where you've got your easygoing kid, you've got your difficult kid, and we have to figure out how they each learn, right? And for one kid, it could be I'm really regulated and I need my, my schedule to stay really consistent. And then there's the kid at the other end that is like, I can go anywhere, do anything and be really laid back. When we understand our kid's temperament, where they struggle, where they excel, then we can look at those areas where they struggle and figure out, okay, what can I do to help them with this, right? How, how can I help them adjust to this? Like, so... Um, our son, when he was little, he would get really, really uh, frustrated when it was time to like do homework in third grade, which like, come on, homework in third grade. This is crazy that we have to sit here for an hour and do homework. And he couldn't sit still. So we'd have to be like, you have to go outside and we'd have him run laps. 
get, getting outside in the fresh air, getting some exercise. We had to teach him some coping skills when he would start to get agitated and feel frustrated. Okay, you need a movement break. Let's go do a movement break. Then he'd come in, he'd be able to sit down. Rather than us trying to push him through and tell him, you can do this, we recognized what he needed in that moment was a movement break to calm his body and calm his brain. So when we understand the wiring, how our kids learn best, how they prefer to communicate, like my daughter's a verbal processor. She wants to talk, 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 talk about what's happened. Our son is a, nope, give me some space. I need to chill out. I'll come and talk to you when I'm ready. When we understand that, again, then we don't take it personally, but then we can meet our kids where they're at. Then we also have to look at our parenting style and how all of these things work together. Our parenting style, their temperament, their development, how does all that work together? When we have that, then it's going to be much easier to find strategies to implement that actually work for everybody. And I love because I think that that is part of what I'm seeing some parents taking to the other side. And that is the concept of, oh, we are friends. And then sometimes we forget that, no, we are the parent. And because I'm the parent, is my responsibility is my responsibility to understand the needs of my child. Is my responsibility to see how I can meet those responsibilities. And that is one of the things that I think that a lot of parents from the previous generation did with us on that parentifying that make us responsible and make the child responsible. The child is not responsible. The child is the child. We are right. the parent. And then assuming the responsibility, I love how you are saying it, on also being understanding and i want to hear your expertise with this their personality and how they learn and their behavior had a lot less to do with you and what you did right or wrong and more with just who they are yeah. because there's a lot of moms that start thinking like well may maybe i make a mistake maybe it was because of this a lot of the times it's not because stop being so egocentric it's not because everything that you did is because like you say with your two children One likes to talk, the other one don't. Mm -hmm. And so on that one, Jill, as we start thinking with the self-care and with that, what is a good um, improvement process? Because as one of the most, I will say, frustrating things with children is that as soon as you start trying, as soon as you are feeling that you're figuring out things, <laughs> they go to the next development phase or, the next improvement, or to the next stage. And then you feel like you were thrown back into the basement to start over. So what would be a good system? And then I would love to hear this from you too, to, un to make understand the parents that this is a journey that is yes. going to take 20, 26 years. Yes. So there we don't feel like, oh, I am failing because I've been trying this for seven years and it's not working. But then what kind of improvement cycle we can do to be aware of this is working, this is not working. My Do the child need change in age? H how is that um, environment connection of parent-child while they are growing? So I always... I always talk to parents about like a framework, the framework that I that I use is, you know, whenever something is going on first, understand developmentally what's what's normal for that age, what they should and shouldn't be doing, you know, what what's going on in their brains. Like, for example, in the teenage years, you know, oh, they're they're listening and they're tired and they're they're lazy and blah, blah, blah. Their brain is under reconstruction in the teen years and it's filled with all sorts of chemicals, which diminishes their ability to have energy to get up earlier. Their brains are in a different circadian rhythm. They, um, it makes it harder for them to follow directions. So when we see those kinds of things, when we understand that, then we can look at that behavior in a different way. Kind of like I said, using that different magnifying glass. So that should always be the place or the place that I always recommend starting. Look at, see the behavior. Okay, let me do some research on that and figure out developmentally What, what they should be doing in this area. Once we know that, then, okay, now let's look at my child's wiring. They're struggling with this. Is it because from the emotional standpoint, they're having a tough time regulating with this? Okay, so what can I do to support them? Is there a sensory component to this? Like I said, that's a whole different show, but sensory plays a big role in our little one's emotions and how they interact with the world. So if it's a little one who's maybe really overwhelmed by sound, oh gosh, can we do something different with homework and put them someplace quieter where they have less distractions? So understanding that wiring piece and then looking at, 
our reactions to those things? Do I need to change something there? If you use that framework of development, individual wiring, my role in it, and put it all together, you have a framework that will take you through each and every challenge that comes up as a parent. Because I love that you said that. I tell parents that all the time. Just about the time you think you got one, one stage down, guess what? You're going to move on to the next one. And that's why I always say that being a parent is like the most expensive self-improvement course you could ever take because you learn so much about yourself over the years. Like, oh, I thought I had this down. I guess I've got some more internal work that I need to do because I'm struggling with this. Right? And I love, love, love that part that you bring it up because it's true. It's I think that a conscious... Um, well, anyway, even if he's unconscious, parenting is the most expensive um, self-development. <laughs> when I build that one to you, course that you can have because it's always pushing you into look your own, your own reactions, your own triggers, your own mm -hmm. tendencies to not take self-care because the reality is when you are believing that self-care for you is not important, that has to do a lot more with your worth and self and parenting is throwing it in your face. So yeah. I love absolutely everything that we talk now, Jill, from everything that we talk, I know that there are millions of golden nuggets on this, on this podcast today in this TV show. It, as a closure, as a conclusion, what would be one big message for all these moms that are facing these challenging behaviors that are trying to do things different than what was happening with them when they were children, what would be one message for them? And then if they fall in love with you, if they connect energetically and emotionally and hardly with you, like I did, how they can connect with you, how they can stay in touch with you. Okay. So the one big tip that I always give parents because it is so overwhelming, there's so much going on with our kids behaviorally and the the yelling and the tantrums and all of that is to focus on one thing at a time, just one thing at a time. So I always suggest starting with the thing that is draining the most energy for you. So if you have a little one that is melting down every single time mealtime comes along and you feel that ugh, right there, work on that one thing, right? Figure out what's going on with the development. Are you expecting too much? What's going on with their wiring? what's going on with you and what strategies you're going to implement and just focus on that one thing and then just do your best to muddle in the others. Because if we can focus on the thing that's taking the most energy and we get that under control, then we can move on to the next thing. Then we can move on to the next thing. And then guess what? Your confidence, I always call it your parenting self-esteem. Your parenting self-esteem starts to shoot through the roof. And oh, look at it, I gave myself a thumb. <laughs> and then when that happens, your confidence as a parent just is so big that you feel like, well, I can handle anything. If I could have handled this and this and this, I can handle this, the next thing because now I have the framework. So now I can just move on and attack the next thing. So when we work on everything, we accomplish nothing. So work on just one thing. And on those days where you're feeling really overwhelmed, just say, okay, I'm just working on this today. This is all I'm working with. Get one thing down and then move on to the next. And pretty soon you really won't have much left. Uh, absolutely amazing. Now, how they can connect with you? Uh, they can head over to my website, which is the mentor mom blog.com. Or if they're looking for some resources and links to my socials, they can go to the mentor mom blog.com backslash resources where I have a tantrum tip uh, download that they can grab on ways to avoid power struggles with little ones. So go and I love how you say the mentor mom blog.com. Mm -hmm. uh, Go and follow Jill in all her social. Go and get the tantrum tip and the power of struggles resources that she had available for you. Thank you so much, Jill. This was a pleasure. I cannot wait to have you back in the show. We were talking about doing another one. I think that we need to do two more. One for language and one for uh, sensory. Sensory. Oh, that's Thank a big one. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It was a pleasure. This show can also be heard on the Spanglish Radio Network. Please check out www.spanglishworld.ca for all the news and programming. Spanglish World. Watch it, hear it, read it, download it, and 